own sleep disorder. There is known to be highly associated with many uh, sleep, I mean, many eye conditions. Yeah, yeah. I've been talking about uh, one of my personal stories in relation to this as well. As I only have about right, 15 right. to 20 minutes, I'll be clear. Um, I do not have any conflict of interest. I may discuss a therapy that is not necessarily approved by the FDA for sleep apnea treatment. We'll be focusing on atrophic sleep apnea, which is a more serious form of sleep apnea. This is a picture showing what happens if you come in for the sleep study, overnight sleep study in the sleep laboratory. We monitor top to bottom everything, like a sleep brain waves and muscle tone, eye movements, breathing effort in the chest and around the belly, and oxygen uh, through the finger oximeter, and we monitor EKG, heart rhythm, as well as muscle tone. Uh, another picture is an example of what's called a home sleep study devices. But this is a little bit misleading name because uh, home devices do not necessarily monitor sleep. It, those are uh, uh, designed to monitor breathing uh, at home, out of center sleep apnea testing or home sleep apnea testing. There are many different types of uh, monitoring devices. Uh, this is an example of uh, polysomnography or sleep study um, uh, raw data. If you, uh, uh, okay, this is one minute uh, recording and with like a sleep brain waves and sleep stage, uh, stage it, heart rhythm and the sleeping position being on the back sleep time position. And these four things are about sleep uh, breathing, actual breathing and breathing effort. And you, as you can see in here, breathing effort is present, but the breathing is diminished. Hypopnea or apnea and the following oxygen desaturation lowering from 95% down to 87%. An example of uh, apnea episode happening when a person is in a super position. This is a one page diagram of summary of the sleep study night. Uh, this patient has severe obstructive sleep apnea in that there were a lot, if you look at this, this is oxygen curve, showing a lot of lowering of the oxygen. It's better, and it's better because the patient was just placed on the CPAP. As you can see at the bottom, CPAP was started and increased. The patient is finally sleeping greatly, including during the REM sleep, without any events. Including during the REM sleep, rapid eye movements uh, with a CPAP arm. <clears throat> this is an example of a CPAP mask uh, covering both nose and mouth. Uh, the first line treatment for sleep apnea. Uh, when treated using CPAP, the machine can give us a lot of information, like um, uh, UCG hours and the therapy outcomes like this. And this is graphical information that you can get from the CPAP machine, like what the pressure is, uh, how many events are happening. Um, so we can gather a lot of uh, useful information from this CPAP. So I'll skip. Uh, here's my sort of a personal experience about uh, how I became to know about some of the importance of the sleep apnea in uh, some of uh, eye conditions. I was uh, a faculty at the University of Iowa. One of the faculty, Suhan Heire, uh, he's a physician eye doctor. He uh, sent a lot of patients with uh, what's called an AION, uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy patients for urgent sleep studies, asking uh, like a bagging for an urgent studies. So I knew something about AION and the association with the sleep apnea. I was visiting my mother in Korea in the uh, summer of 2017. One day when I was uh, having a breakfast, she told me about her having sudden complete blackout uh, blindness in one eye. She didn't tell me initially because uh, she was worried that I it may be ruining my uh, vacation time in Korea. But then as soon as she told me, uh, I asked her to go to the eye clinic locally. And there she was uh, found to have op optic disc swelling. And the afternoon I uh, called my friend, uh, eye doctor and uh, had a retina exam. And it showed some findings that might be suspicious for AION. Voila, there was AION that I knew uh, from other eye doctors from Iowa. So I uh, made an appointment uh, with an op optic neuropathy expert 
Um, and that was the diagnosis was confirmed after about four days later. And that day I arranged a sleep study uh, in Korea. I'm quite well known in Korea among sleep doctors. So I was able to have my mom coming for the night of sleep study and that sleep study showed her having obstructive sleep apnea. And she was started with a CPAP right away. Uh, over time, uh, her uh, blindness uh, improved from complete blackout into some cloudiness. And also she regained peripheral part of the vision. Uh, the central vision uh, was still cloudy. She is using CPAP therapy every night, very compliant. And there's no recurrence of AION of the same eye or the other eye. In fact, in AION, the concern is actually it's affecting the other side of the eye. And it never happened uh, since 2017. This is just anecdotal uh, uh, case, nothing really scientific. And I'm sure other speakers will talk about AION and its treatment, but it's really serious condition coming from ischemia, uh, decreasing the blood flow of the optic nerve. But anyways, I'll be uh, going back to a uh, definition of obstructive sleep apnea, which is, as you can read in here, it's repetitive episodes of either complete uh, cessation or partial breathing uh, resulting in the apnea or hypopnea in the upper airway that is occurring during sleep. And it often results in decrease in the blood oxygen saturation as we saw in what, some of the pictures. And it's usually terminated by brief arousals because we cannot actually stay in apneic episode. We have to wake up to uh, be able to stay alive. It's very common condition, depending on where you start counting the significance of obstructive sleep apnea. One in every five adults, 15 to 20% of the uh, entire adult population have uh, at least mild obstructive sleep apnea. It's more common in men than in women. However, postmenopausal age women, it becomes one to one. Uh, age is another risk factor. Being obese is another risk factor. There's a, some question about race, but what's almost for sure is that, and it's relevant in like Orange County or, or community with a lot of uh, East Asian uh, population or Southeast Asian population. In Asian people, BMI uh, doesn't really matter. We see a lot of people with normal BMI or thin uh, BMI, BMI less, even less than 20 with uh, moderate to severe uh, sleep apnea, especially in women, because it's related to the, the craniofacial structure, basically having not big enough space to house all the soft tissues. This graph is just showing uh, the x-axis being the age. As we get older, the prevalence of sleep apnea increases, like age being another risk factor for sleep apnea. Um, this is a, a, a figure that is showing what truly happens with our body, especially body autonomic nervous system uh, during the episode of apnea and following. So it's about like, uh, uh, about one minute of monitoring in a person with apnea, like not breathing or shallow breathing. Uh, this is a uh, direct measure of sympathetic activity. It's not very easy to monitor sympathetic nerve activity directly. Um, and it was measured and as apnea uh, progresses, sympathetic activity uh, starts going up and up. And as a result, what happens with our blood pressure and heart rate, heart start beating faster than in here getting faster and blood pressure goes up. It was like in a person with about 130 over 70, going up to 220 over 150 of blood pressure. Very uh, sudden change in the blood pressure. It's, it can be scary. And this can really explain well why a person with obstructive sleep apnea would develop high blood pressure and even stroke or heart attack or also uh, one of the uh, serious uh, heart condition called atrial fibrillation arrhythmia. How do you diagnose? As I showed, the diagnosis is through the test, either attending a laboratory polysomnography, which is the norm, or out of center sleep testing or home sleep apnea testing. Um, in a primary care setting, if you see a primary care physician, um, you can ask for, can, I, can you screen me for possible sleep apnea and send me to a sleep study or sleep doctors? There's a, what's called a stop bank criteria, which is uh, pretty uh, commonly uh, applied in primary care setting. Uh, just acronym S-T-O-B, uh, B-A-N-G, it's pressure. 
stop bang snoring, tiredness, observe apneas, high blood pressure, high BMI, age, and extra conference being uh, thick and gender. When it's uh, when there are three or more, it's a high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Going back to some of the other examples of sleep apnea, um, this uh, one night of a sleep study is showing that sleep apnea is highly associated, like here, there are a lot of sleep apneas and here as well. And these coincide with this black uh, uh, bar, which indicates REM sleep, R sleep. So sleep apnea is much more common, five to 10 times more frequent and severe than non-REM sleep uh, as shown in here. So when we are in a dream sleep, sleep apnea can be much more severe. So this person sleeping, not on the back, uh, sleeping on the left side, but in the rapid eye movement sleep, have, having uh, these sleep uh, hypopnic episodes. Here's another example of another patient with a lot of sleep apneas right here and here. Whenever there is a lot of cluster of sleep apneas, you try to correlate with the uh, REM? No, not really. This patient's REM sleep pretty clean, no sleep apneas, right? Every time the patient is having a lot of sleep apneas, here, something, here, here. Whenever in this body position, which is back, on the back, a lot of sleep apneas. In fact, this patient has a sleep apnea almost exclusively during the REM, I mean, during the supine position sleep. This patient doesn't have REM, uh, supine sleep, and that's why we don't see much worse sleep apneas. Every time the patient was on the REM sleep, the patient was on the side, okay? So uh, this uh, two examples tell us that sleep obstructive sleep apnea is highly dependent on the supine sleeping position and also highly dependent on the REM sleep, sleep stage. So this patient uh, that we saw, supine related, in non-REM sleep, a lot of repeated uh, sleep apneic episodes, and on the side, non-REM sleep, breathing is fine. Very clean, uh, regular breathing with oxygen saturation above 95%. And even in the REM sleep, a lot of rapid eye movements you see here, on the left side, the patient did not have to sleep apneic episodes. So this, this is an example of supine position dependent obstructive sleep apnea. How do we treat? Uh, come, I mean, the, the norm of the treatment is PAP, positive airway pressure therapy, either using CPAP or BiPAP. Alternatives in those who cannot use the CPAP or BiPAP, maybe oral appliance therapy for mild form of sleep apnea or more severe form of sleep apnea. It'll be uh, what's called the Inspire therapy. You probably start seeing a lot of Inspire therapy in the TV commercial recently. It's uh, stimulating one of the nerves that's uh, controlling the uh, airway, especially the tongue muscles. The rest of the therapy uh, uh, would include like uh, surgery, like UP3, doesn't really work well. Tracheostomy putting a hole in the trachea used to be the treatment of choice before the CPAP uh, was introduced in 19, early 1980s. Prior to that, the only treatment cure was tracheostomy. That's a scary, right? And the surgery of advancing the bones, the true surgery, maxillofacial surgery of advancing, making more room in the back of the tongue, that can be also cured. Sleeping position, we talked about it. Would avoiding supine sleep be of help? Yes, in some cases, in many cases, but we do not have full control over our body position, and that is a problem. Pharmacotherapy, is there a drug, is there a medication that can actually help with the obstructive sleep apnea? If you pay attention, you might have seen some news article recently about a, a combination medication called uh, um, it's uh, uh, oxybutynin and uh, atomoxetin or stratera combination, but I would not uh, actually uh, mean it's a uh, sort of uh, published uh, article and study, but it's uh, too much of a rosy picture than true. This is an example of oral appliance therapy, like by wearing it, it's moving the jaw bone, mandibular bone forward, MAD, mandibular advancement therapy. It can be a good alternative to the CPAP in mild cases of obstructive sleep apnea. UP3, uh, uvula palatoparyngoplasty, taking the chunk of the soft tissues out, including uvula. Uh, it may help with the snoring initially, but eventually, after many years, the sleep apnea uh, will be bad or even get worse. This is an example of inspired therapy, hypoglossal nerve stimulation therapy, having an implant here, which is to make the nerve, hypoglossal nerve, and as a consequence, you open up the airway to some degree. Looks like fancy, but still, outcome is not as good as the CPAP therapy. 
And this is an example of how we monitor CPAP, I mean, inspired therapy, but this does not give us an outcome data. It's just UC data. And UC Irvine actually has a lot of experience with Inspire, probably the, the biggest Inspire provider in the uh, Southern California or Orange County. Weight loss can help, but it's not often not a cure for sleep apnea. It can help with the severe of sleep apnea. And here are the take home points, but as I'm taking too much of time, I'll just uh, yeah, make this available. Uh, and now, now I think I can take uh, questions, I believe, but it'll be probably have to be short. So I don't think I have any questions what? here, but let's see. Let's see, Dr. M, there are some questions here. Um, let's see, we have a question about um, AION. What types of treatment did she have and did her eye finally restore uh, normally? And so did I it think affect our, her second the, eye? Right, so the uh, our uh, another speaker will be talking about AION and I'm not here as an eye doctor with expertise in AION. So the treatment of AION might be controversial, but what my mom received was a high-dose prednisone therapy, and also she received erythropoietin therapy into the IV intravenous uh, erythropoietin therapy. Uh, and uh, when I did my own sort of research, uh, this erythropoietin therapy was used as an intraocular injection in the past. Um, as it's a result of ischemia, like uh, blood flow, I think erythropoietin might be being used to maybe enhance the oxygen supply of blood flow but I'm not the expert, and uh, or another speaker will talk about the treatment of AION, I believe. Um, let's see. A few of our uh, attendees are having trouble with the sound, for which we apologize. Um, there aren't any other questions in the chat, but if anybody would like to unmute themselves to ask Dr. Im a question, we have a few minutes to do that. Is there anybody who would like to? Um, ask a question. You know what, Dana, there's one more uh, question in the chat. It says, should people with OSA sleep on their side then? So that's a great question. It, I think it depends on what your sleep study showed, depending on sleeping position. So when sleep study is being done, we do monitor uh, sleeping position, and we can come up with a severity of sleep apnea based on the body position. And you can ask uh, to your sleep position about how your sleeping position may affect your outcome of sleep uh, apnea. And a lot of people, uh, on average in my uh, database, uh, between sleeping on the back versus on the side, there's about five to six times difference. So in supine position, sleep apnea will be five, six times more frequent and worse. Mm -hmm. So avoiding being on the back can reduce the severity of sleep apnea significantly. But like I told you, it's not very easy to achieve non-supine sleep because when you're in, uh, in the sleep, it, there's no easy way to ensure a certain type of sleeping position. I have a question. Um, what do the initials AION stand for? I didn't see or hear that discussed. Right, so AION will, will be another topic uh, by another speaker soon, but it's anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, it's a condition uh, resulting in like a sudden blindness of the eye. Um, and it's uh, uh, thought to be from ischemia of the optic nerve, like a uh, blood flow. But uh, uh, I'm not the expert in AI, so I'm going to defer these uh, answers or uh, things to uh, the next speaker. I didn't do it. Great. Um, I think there was one more question in the chat, Lewis. Could you share that with Dr. M? So the other question here in the chat is about stomach sleep. So when I looked at my data, there's no big difference between sleeping on the side versus stomach. So as long as avoiding supine, like avoiding uh, the position of being on the back, uh, other, other position like left side or right side or stomach, would be resulting in about the same type of uh, uh, benefit or improvement from sleep apnea. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, the possibility of an adjustable bed. Dr. M, does that make a difference? 
So adjustable bed usually raises the upper portion of the head, uh, body, like uh, resulting in head of the bed elevation rather than promoting a certain like type of side position for stomach sleep. But even head of bed elevation can be of help, especially in people with obesity and uh, sleep apnea. So in a really obese person like morbid obesity who has obstructive sleep apnea, would have a condition uh, called in hypoventilation, the depth of breathing being diminished on top of sleep apnea, in, especially in these people that head of bed elevation using these adjustable bed may be able to help. Great. Well, if, um, if there are no more questions for Dr. Im, um, we will thank him very much for his uh, participation. And he'll stick around and answer questions at the end if you have any more after listening to our other speakers. Um, and now we're going to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Olivia Lee. The second is waking up with eye pain. And the third is my tips for bedtime eye routines. So let's start with the association between obstructive sleep apnea and eye health. There are actually many associations between this condition, obstructive sleep apnea, and various eye conditions. So I've listed several of them here today, and I'm going to talk about a few of them, and Dr. Adir Rekwema will also talk about some of them. So let's start with floppy eye syndrome. So this is a condition where the laxity of the upper eyelid is so loose that with very simple um, pulling of the upper eyelid, the upper eyelid will flip over or evert itself. And this happens commonly during sleep. Uh, if this happens chronically, it will lead to irritation, dryness, redness of the eye. And some of these patients can wake up with severe pain because the eye has rubbed against the pillow while they have been asleep. And this tends to be more severe in patients with more severe sleep apnea. Dr. E will talk more about the surgical aspects of that condition in her next talk. Diabetic retinopathy is a condition that is a complication of diabetes mellitus. And it is typically associated with severity of glucose in the sugar, the sugar in the blood. And independent of that, uh, sleep apnea increases the risk of progression of diabetic retinopathy or diabetes in the eye. So the more severe the sleep apnea is, the higher the risk of progression, especially to the most severe form of diabetic retinopathy that involves new blood vessel growth. And we call that proliferative diabetic retinopathy. As a reminder, all diabetics need to be screened for diabetic retinopathy, at least on a yearly eye exam, if not more frequently as determined by the results of that eye exam. Now, normal tension glaucoma is also associated with obstructive sleep apnea. And you have an increased risk of glaucoma anywhere between 45% to even 200% in certain studies. And the thought uh, behind why this association exists is that when you are asleep, there is decrease in your blood pressure, and that influences how much blood flow and how much oxygen gets to the optic nerve. Over time, this can lead to damage to the optic nerve, where above you see a healthy optic nerve with a small, what we call disc, inside the optic nerve head. And on the lower picture, you see a larger one, and you see a little hemorrhage off to the lower left-hand corner. This patient has normal tension glaucoma, and we call it normal tension because the typical glaucoma you hear about is associated with high pressure inside of the eye, but this type of glaucoma is typically associated with normal or even low um, eye pressure in the eye. Now, the treatment for sleep apnea involves using a CPAP. And if this CPAP blows air that escapes from the mask and enters the eye or blows the eyelid open while you're sleeping, this can cause chronic dryness and irritation. 
And often these patients will wake up with very, very dry eyes or very red eyes uh, or conjunctivitis that's not a infection type of pink eye. This is often due to air leakage from the mask itself blowing up towards the eye. And so you can fix that by adjusting the fit of the mask or changing to a different style of mask. But if that's not possible, or if you've tried many different styles of CPAP and you're still having this problem, then you could address it by wearing goggles to protect the eyes from the air leak coming out of the mask. I will show you some of the examples of that a little bit later. So the mask comes very close to um, the eyes because it goes right over the nose. And so that's why the air blows directly at the eyes if there's an air leak. So a lot of patients just end up wearing goggles when they sleep using the CPAP. The next condition I want to talk about is keratoconus. And the cone in keratoconus means that there's a cone-shaped weakening of the cornea that would normally be round. And as that weakening in the collagen tissue within the cornea progresses, you get a progressive change in the shape until that cornea becomes very cone-shaped. Patients with sleep apnea have a higher uh, probability of having keratoconus, but then again, keratoconus is also associated with floppy eyelid syndrome, obesity, eye rubbing, and so it's not clear if the sleep apnea itself is the risk factor of keratoconus or it's the other associated conditions that occur with it. Either way, keratoconus in its most severe form needs corneal transplantation, but uh, if we can control the eye rubbing and these other factors, sometimes that can help. We also have a, a procedure called corneal crosslinking that helps to prevent progression of this disease. Now I'd like to move on to the next topic, which is what I call waking up with eye pain. So a lot of people um, feel better when they wake up and they have less redness, less pain. But there are some people who feel like when they wake up, they feel the worst. And so why would that be? Why would you wake up with your eyes feeling more painful, more irritated, more red in the morning when you wake up? One possibility is that there's an eyelid abnormality preventing complete closure of the upper and the lower eyelids. And some of these patients you can tell right away, for example, in this, this example here, that lower lid is so droopy that when the upper lid comes down, it doesn't meet that droopy eyelid. This does need to be corrected surgically. On the other hand, some patients don't realize this, they have this problem because it only happens during sleep. So uh, this can happen one of two ways. There can either be a problem with eyelid closure that you see in the daytime, or maybe you only see it when the patient blinks that the two eyelids don't meet, but with force and effort and conscious closing of the eye, they can force the two eyelids shut. On the other hand, there are patients who don't realize this is happening at all. And when they're uh, peacefully asleep and dreaming, their eyelids flutter and their eyelids open a little bit. There are two circumstances here. One is where the eye rolls upward and there is none of the cornea that is exposed. Whereas this patient doesn't have that what we call Bell's phenomenon, where the eyeball kind of rolls up while you're asleep, and therefore you see that part of the cornea here is exposed. And that part is going to be very dry and potentially so dry that it gets scratched. So what is the solution to this problem? The simplest thing you can do is buy some lubricating gel or ointment, does not have to be medicated, and you apply this to the eye when you go to sleep. So that pre provides a thick layer of moisture between the outside air and your, the surface of the eye. If that doesn't work, then you can cover the eye in some way. And I don't mean the kind of sleep mask, the satin type of sleep mask that um, you see uh, you like fancy ladies use when they go to sleep to prevent um, them from waking up from the light. That kind of mask will not help because if your eyelids are open a little bit and then you put this silk mask in front of it, the cloth is going to touch your eyeball. Instead, you want to make sure the eyelid is actually closed or you have some kind of device that traps moisture inside 
So the simplest way to do this is to get a piece of tape and you tape the eyelid this way, not this way. Uh, and you can put the ointment on underneath, but don't put too much, otherwise the tape will not stick. Another option is what we call a moisture chamber. And a moisture chamber can be achieved either with this type of sticker, kind of like a band-aid material, but then it has a clear plastic that vaults in front. So whatever moisture you apply on the eye, that moisture gets trapped there. Uh, the problem with these patches is it loses its stickiness, and so it, you can only use it for one, two, maybe three nights before you have to get a new one. Another way to do this is with plastic wrap. Um, the brand called Glad Press and Seal works the best, and you can do this as a DIY thing at home. Um, but if that doesn't seem to stick well for you, you certainly can buy sleep goggles. And this concept is just like swimming goggles. It's trying to trap moisture inside um, and you can get these clear kinds, and this is a lower profile good for using with a CPAP, or these blue ones are opaque. So if you have problems with waking up from the light, this would help you as well. Clearly, you're not going to wear these blue opaque ones during the day. These are just for sleep. What about this condition called recurrent corneal erosion syndrome? The classic um, story that the patient will tell us is that they woke up in the middle of the night with severe, severe eye pain, or first thing in the morning, they open their eyes and they have excruciating pain. And by the time they get to the eye doctor later in the afternoon, it's already either resolved or much, much better. And then a few weeks or months pass and the whole thing happens again. So this means that the patient is having a corneal abrasion or a scratch on the cornea and it's happening recurrently. This can happen because of one or two things. One possibility that is that this is acquired after a prior trauma. Maybe the patient had a prior um, corneal abrasion and it never healed quite properly and there's some weakness in how it healed. Or you can have what's called a basement epithelial membrane dystrophy where just you have this problem where the layers of the cornea just are not well adherent to each other. And either way, what happens is when you are asleep, your eyelids move, or in the morning, you wake up and you open your eyelids. And the simple opening of the eyelid, the eyelid moving over the cornea, that force by itself, which is so gentle, can just rip off the cells that sit on top of the cornea, leaving you with a corneal abrasion. So this definitely needs to be evaluated by an ophthalmologist we can see certain signs on exam. And if it's happening over and over, very, very frequently, there are treatments that we can suggest. Finally, I'll close with this view of my do's and don'ts for a bedtime eye routine. So I suggest you do these things. Definitely, if you're a contact lens wearer, please take your contact lenses out before you go to sleep. Um, and then, either throw them away if they're dailies or properly disinfect them, store them in a clean contact lens case that should have been dried out during the day, put clean solution in there. Please don't try to save money by using dailies for weeks or months or use ones that are supposed to be thrown away at the end of the month, use them for half a year. Um, and please don't try to save solution by putting extra solution for several days. Please remove your eye makeup. Um, and definitely, especially if you are one of these people who likes to put eyeliner on, a, on the lid margin, or they call it tight lining, um, please make sure you wash that off so that you don't trap makeup on the oil glands that produce part of your tears. And if you already have a diagnosis of dry eye, I'm sure your eye doctor has already talked to you about doing warm compresses, um, which is just a hot towel with warm water, and you lay that over your eyes with the eyes closed, and you let that warm steam go towards your eyes for five or 10 minutes. And right before you go to sleep, you can apply a nighttime gel or ointment to lubricate the eyes and let them um, all those dry spots you've incurred over the daytime to heal those while you're sleeping. What you really don't want to do is shower or sleep in your contact lenses or store them overnight in 
tap water or homemade solutions or topping off the contact solution in other words leaving the old contact solution from the night before and just putting a little extra you can see that some people um, have really terrible habits when it comes to contact lens um, storage and use and so this is an actual contact lens case that the patient brought in and it was literally this dirty um, and i actually tried to pick a relatively not so scary picture of a infection incurred from overuse of contact lens wear or inappropriate use of contact lens wear, you can get all kinds of infections, uh, most commonly bacterial, but even I've had several patients with uh, a very unusual parasite that they got from contact lens wear. And again, we talked about removing the eye makeup, especially the makeup that you put on the eyelid margin, because that's where the tears come out of the eyelid and you don't want to cover up those openings. So in conclusion, obstructive sleep apnea is associated with a number of eye conditions. The CPAP, which is used to treat sleep apnea and or the lack of eyelid closure when you sleep can cause chronic eye dryness and irritation. If you wake up with severe pain from recurrent corneal abrasions, that might be from recurrent corneal erosion syndrome. And again, please don't sleep in your contact lenses or your eye makeup, especially eyeliner. If any of these things sound familiar to you, please come in for an eye exam. We have two locations to serve you, one in Orange and one in Irvine. Here's our eye institute located on the campus of UC Irvine. It, uh, it is called Gavin Herbert Eye Institute and I invite all of you to come and visit us anytime. Thank you so much and I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, hold on a second, let's uh, change this. Uh, here we go. Dr. Lee should be on now to take yeah, I'm here. questions. Oh, great, there you are. Thank you, Dr. Lee, that was terrific. There's some questions in the chat for you and if um, our guests have questions, they can ask them in person if that's okay with you. Sure, um, I answered one of the questions in the chat already and it was about the ointments or lubricating gels that you could use at night. Um, there are many different brands. The most common that you can easily find in any drugstore, even some supermarkets carry it, are Refresh PM, Gentile Gel, and the thickest of the thick, it's almost like petroleum jelly, is Lacrolube, um, which um, is also made by the Refresh brand. And so certainly if you are one of these people who already has dry eye, putting one of these gels at night is a good idea. But certainly if you are worried that the eyelid is opening just a little bit when you're asleep, whether that's from sleep apnea, um, associated floppy eyelid syndrome, or you just don't close the lids all the way, um, for whatever reason, you can definitely try one of those ointments first. And if that takes care of your problem, great, then you don't need to go towards all the other things I talked about, like the goggles and such. Any other questions? Uh, there are some questions popping up in the chat, Dr. Lee. Are you able to? I, yeah, I see them. The question is like, uh, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I was wondering what time you recommend to stop using screens before bed in order to help dry eyes, for example, an hour. So it's not so much what time you use, you do the screen time or reading. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be phone or um, tablet or TV. It could also just be like you know, old fashioned books, uh, magazines. It's the time that you spend concentrating on looking at one distance for a very long period of time inter uninterrupted. You see our normal eyes, we will blink at least once every 10 seconds because our tear film stays intact for approximately 10 seconds if you're producing normal tears. At 10 seconds, you'll have some loss of tears by evaporation. So you'll naturally blink at that point and each blink will give you a nice fresh layer of tears. But when you're concentrating on looking at one thing for a very long time, say you're 
using the computer or you're reading a book and you're really concentrating on what you're doing, you will naturally decrease your blink rate. You might not blink for 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds. And if that just goes on for 10, 15 minutes, that's one thing. But if you do it continuously for several hours without stopping, your eyes will get dry. So the more hours you do that in a row, that's what's going to uh, exacerbate your dry eye. So for example, during this COVID pandemic, a lot of people have been working at home that used to go into the office and yes, you would sit in front of a computer, but every so often you get up, you go to a meeting or you go chat with your office mates. Well, there wasn't any more of that. And you just sit in front of the computer for hours upon hours and hours. And a lot of people who never previously had dry eye developed it. Uh, okay, so I see some other um, questions. Is the eye gel used over the eyelid? No, the gels that I was mentioning are used inside the eye. So I would recommend you use one finger to pull the eyelid down. And in that pink pocket, you take the, the gel and you draw a line like you're drawing a line of toothpaste on your toothbrush right into that pink pocket. And then once you close the eye blink, it gets all over the surface of the eye. And I would recommend doing this the last thing before you go to sleep. Not like you do it and then watch the 10 o'clock news or, or you know, check your email before going to sleep because you will not be able to see very well. Uh, the gel is very blurring, so it will make your vision um, blurred, but that's why it's intended for when you sleep. Um, okay, so the next question is, what about punctal plugs? Is there a time limit on how long they can be left in the eye? I've had them for several years and they do help with my dry eyes. So interesting you ask how long because there are definitely plugs that are intended for permanent use. So there are in general two types of punctal plugs. Uh, but let me back up for the rest of the audience so in case they don't know what we're talking about. So the punctum is a very small hole on the inner corner of both eyes and it's the entrance to the tear drainage duct and then the tears drain through that hole down to the nose. So if you have a dry eye, you want to keep the tears on the eye. So you put a little plug in that hole and they come in two forms. One is dissolvable and it's very temporary. And the other one is made of silicone and can last forever. So if you feel that they are very helpful, I would just get the permanent ones. Um, okay, and long hours driving can cause dry eyes. Similar to what I was saying before, you know, if you're concentrating and looking at one distance for a very long time, but then also when you're in the car, especially the last week or so, it's been so hot. If you have the air conditioning blowing right at your face, that's gonna cause evaporation of your tears. So if that sounds familiar to you, you know, just blow the air conditioning to, to your, towards your feet. Okay, I don't wanna take time away from Dr. Yujira Rema, so I'm gonna sign off now and let her continue. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, I'm just a little bit worried because we're about to run out of time. And I wanted to make sure we talk about it a little bit more. I'm hopefully able to answer any questions that are still remaining for Dr. Lee as well. Um, so um, my name is Ligon Dieteri Wipoma. Actually, uh, I'm, I don't know if Dana was going to say anything, but I can introduce myself. Um, I am dual fellowship trained in oculoplastic and reconstructive surgery, as well as neuro-ophthalmology. Um, uh, Dana, you can see everything, right, by the way? And hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to focus on floppy eyelid syndrome that Dr. Lee already kind of gave a nice introduction to, as well as an optic neuropathy that's um, very highly correlated with sleep apnea. Um, and uh, as we go along, feel free to interrupt me um, to clarify anything. Um, so as been has, I only have one slide on this because I know this has been kind of discussed uh, ad nauseum at this point. But as everyone uh, probably already knows. Um, their sleep apnea is sort of marked by these apneic episodes or uh, periods by which you aren't breathing properly or deeply enough um, and sustained enough, which leads to a host of problems. It's, pro it's typically comprised of obstructive versus um, uh, CNS, so neurologic, um, and it's usually correlated with uh, obesity, at least in the obstructive ideology. Um, what does this mean? Well, it leads to a host of uh, sequelae in your body, leading to problems with your lungs, such as pulmonary hypertension, your cardiovascular health, your brain health, 
and then uh, as a segue to your eye health. And so um, as Dr. Lee had alluded to, there's a host of um, diseases that are associated with sleep apnea in the eye. I would say the, the best described and studied are the two, um, in addition to the normal tension glaucoma are floppy eyelid syndrome and dry eye, as well as non arteritic um, ischemic optic neuropathy and tear ischemic optic neuropathy. I'm not gonna keep saying that repetitively, so it's gonna be shortened to N-A-I-O-N. Um, so um, I do treat uh, these patients usually surgically. Um, Dr. Lee and our colleagues in the anterior segment uh, division will manage the dry eye till the eyelid really needs to be addressed. So I'll kind of talk a little bit about clinical uh, presentation and then the surgical approaches. So this was first described in 1981 and it was found in individuals that were typically overweight men and they had this sort of reddened eyelids that everted easily. Um, it was thought that if it was only happening in one eye that they were just preferentially sleeping on that side versus if it was happening on both sides, they would alternate or sleep face down. Um, so what would happen as a result, you know, your eyelids are really the, the main protective mechanism for your ocular surface and the, the gateway to your eye um, was that you would have incomplete eyelid closure, dry eye, sometimes the thinning over the cornea, which is essentially the window, um, you would develop something called an ectasia or keratoconus as Dr. Lee alluded to. Um, and so once these eyelids are, as you can see, easily distracted and averted, not really opposed to the globe, um, the conjunctiva, which is the clear lining within the inside of your eye and over your eye, um, becomes undergoes changes. The cellular structure undergoes changes. Um, and this all results in a lot of symptoms for our patients, ranging from tearing or a sensation that as if sand is on the eye, blurry vision, um, and oftentimes all these symptoms are worse within waking up. Uh, in addition to the host of symptoms one might see in a patient with, you know, sleep apnea. Um, so this is, uh, in, in this external photograph on the three insect here, um, the top one, as you see, this right upper eyelid has sort of a deformed contour and it's totic, it's sagging down and the lashes may actually be um, getting in the way of their, of their visual field. Um, and I'll further describe this clinical maneuver, but you can see is the eyelids are easily distensible as opposed to the other eye. Um, so the etiology of this um, mechanistically is thought to be from repetitive eyelid rubbing, um, and especially if the eyelid stretches and spontaneously averts while sleeping, that's noted to be a high risk feature. Um, and individuals have found that uh, when they look at the tarsus, which is the um, cartilaginous structure within the eyelid that really gives it su structural support. Um, there's a decrease in elastin fibers and, and there's overall laxity. And particularly they've seen um, a heightened activity of something called the matrix metalloproteinase, number seven and nine. Um, and then there's also theories that there's sort of this ischemia reperfusion. So there's this vascular dysregulation that's happening. And so that's what activates this um, deposition of, this, of these MFPs in, in the brain, heart, lungs, which has been shown uh, very well and likely in the eyelids as well. So uh, really nice clinical exam maneuver. Well, first when looking at these patients, and this was first described by Dr. McNabb uh, not too long ago. Um, and <clears throat> the first thing is you will notice that the eyelid, it just looks like, you know, the individuals, you know, no, no pun intended, sleepy. It looks like the eyelid is down and the lashes are usually uh, pointing downwards and you're looking through your lashes. And the maneuver is to take your finger, your thumb, and you vert upward and then laterally. Traditionally, it was just to go up, but really lateral, super temporal. And you'll see a very easy distensibility. The eyelid flips almost easily. In, in a normal individual, that's almost impossible to do unless you know, you're like that little kid in the, in, in the playground trying to do it to scare the other kids. Um, so as the easy as it becomes so um, very easy to flip your lid, then that the inner lining gets quite red and thickened. <clears throat> and so when you see this, or when I see this in the clinic, I almost immediately get worried about is there ex coexisting glaucoma or sleep apnea. <clears throat> and then the data have actually uh, fared out to show a, a pretty notable correlation between this two. So if you first identify a patient with floppy eyelid syndrome or FES. 85% of these patients 
actually do in fact end up having obstructive sleep apnea. And then 77% of those with OSA had some form of eyelid laxity. I believe it was 30 to 40 that really had true FES or floppy eyelid, um, but there was some sort of atropion or lag ophthalmos um, where the eyelid isn't really tightly opposed to, to your globe. Um, the expert sleepiness scale is really useful to help restratify those patients that we might uh, refer. But uh, to be honest, if I diagnose a patient with floppy eyelid, they, all, they will be getting a uh, sleep study uh, if they're willing and if it's able to happen. So as Dr. Lee alluded to, the management initially um, is really aggressive ocular surface lubrication. So the question was, where do you put the drops in ointment? So all of this is going on the ocular surface. So it's not technically inside the eye, it's the outside of the eye, but outside the eye under the, underneath your eyelids. Um, and so um, we wanted it to be preservative free because uh, there's toxicity associated with frequent use of uh, tears with preservatives. Um, and you could put it as often as you like. I like to tell my patients with dry eyes to put these drops in every room that has a monitor. So it's just easy access. Um, ointments at night or as tolerated. Um, you can do an, uh, you can even very just easily tape your eyelids at night with paper tape or the custom made mask as Dr. Lee discussed earlier and humidifiers are really helpful. So in terms of surgical um, approaches to these patients, um, the first thing I wanna emphasize is that I could do this all day long and if we don't treat the obstructive sleep apnea, it will recur. So the surgery will fail if we don't treat the underlying cause of the problem. And so uh, it's very important that be addressed first. So diagnosis and then management of the sleep apnea. But surgically, um, I think, you know, traditionally some, some will um, discuss this sort of a pentagonal wedge that they will um, remove sort of full thickness eyelid. Um, but I find this approach where you kind of have a triangular um, uh, full, thickness, full thickness resection where the arc is maintained with your lid crease. It, it, it tends to heal more cosmetically um, in a more cosmetically pleasing way. And at the same time, you can um, address the canthal tendons and, and tighten um, this aspect of your, of your eyelid architecture. So is what happens is you have extra loose eyelid skin. So you have to remove it, tighten it, um, and by virtue of it, you do sometimes end up shortening this vertical height, which is called the MRD1. If that does happen, we have maneuvers to, to lift the eyelid. Um, but so it, be, it can become a staged approach. Um, some people may do it at the same time. Um, so then moving on to non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy or NAION. So we're going to totally switch gears. Initially, we were talking about the outside, about the eyelid the windows to your eyes, the cornea. Now we're moving inside to your optic nerve. And this is, you know, brain tissue that communicates what you're seeing to your brain. Um, and so this is a, a place where there, if there is an insult at this day and age, it's irreversible. So it's vision loss that's um, to some degree permanent. Um, so it's the most common optic neuropathy. Um, I'm sorry, that should say uh, in patients over 50 years old. Um, it's the second most common cause of permanent vision loss in adults after glaucoma. It's oftentimes painless. It's very quick. Um, some patients will have stepwise, so they'll have sort of a hit and another hit thereafter, um, but it doesn't happen slowly like glaucoma often does. Uh, and these patients usually have this swollen optic nerve that's pink with sometimes um, some hemorrhages, and I'll show you some, uh, some uh, demonstrative pictures momentarily. So um, we don't fully understand how it happens. Uh, it's interestingly enough, these patients typically have these small optic nerves that are crowded with healthy tissue um, and in the setting of other vascular problems. Um, after the insult, 40% usually have some type of improvement and there's a risk of 15 to 20% of having this happen in the other eye, um, which can be quite debilitating. For example, if you're, you know, if it hits both of your eyes and where you read. So this is how, Unfortunately, how patients usually present to me, um, they'll come in saying, you know, they woke up and they, they notice a smudge. Usually women will say they're applying eye makeup, so they're looking under a monocular or one eye condition and they'll notice that. Um, and so usually it's altitudinal and this, is, this has to do with how blood vessels 
be the optic nerve. Um, and I have a picture about that in the last slide. Um, but as a result, um, you have sort of loss of vision in one whole hemisphere of one of your eyes, either when looking, you know, in, in the inferior part or the superior part. So this, um, so this is a visual field demonstrating that loss. And then here we have um, a, mat a presentation. So this patient in the right eye has this swollen pink um, optic nerve with some hemorrhages. And here is a normal uh, optic ner nerve on the other eye. And as you can see, it's very healthy, very tight. So tons of healthy tissue, but crowded. And then this other patient down here is someone who had um, it, it occur in both eyes. So the nerve now has become pale after the insult, um, usually segmentally. So more here and more on the bottom, <coughs> excuse me. And now um, he, they're presenting with the other optic nerve in a edematous state with hemorrhages. Um, so there's a host of risk factors associated. So as you can already look, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, and for the purpose of discussion, this discussion, sleep apnea, um, various co coagulopathies um, that are associated with or increase the risk of NAION. So when I have patients who come in, my first thing is, do you see a primary care doctor? What are your, do you have these risk factors? If not, we need to evaluate. And sometimes we diagnose patients with these diseases. Um, and then if, they're, if they don't truly have any of these diseases, we look for uh, rare associations, and sometimes it's really patients uh, who are on these medications, uh, you know, uh, Viagra, amiodarone, they have been shown very uh, clearly to be correlated um, with, uh, with increasing the risk of NAION. So um, a really great uh, physician up at Iowa described that several, you know, these patients wake up with vision loss, um, and so this, there is likely a correlation with, with sleep apnea. Um, and in fact, multiple studies since then have shown a correlation between 70 to 80%. And this makes sense again, within the context of the other risk factors. And it's really, so this is on the right is our image that shows the sort of the vascular supply to the back of the eye where the optic nerve is. So, um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the retina, and so there's a neurosensory retina that feeds into the optic nerve, and the optic nerve goes back to the brain. And so we have, you know, the main artery here, um, the central retinal artery, and then you have, you know, various other uh, arteries and vasculatures. And our, our theory for, at least for NAION, is that there is some sort of spasm or obstruction or dysregulation um, that's occurring along the short posterior ciliary arteries, whether it's through, you know, atherosclerosis, sleep apnea, or um, whatever other uh, condition that leads to this developing. And there's been several studies looking for treatment, and unfortunately, we really don't have any good treatments uh, today for it. Um, so at this point, I welcome any questions. I work with Dr. Lee at the same locations. Happy to see anyone or answer any uh, questions I see now in the chat. Um, let me pull this up. Uh, is there a charge for a consult for sagging eyelids? Um, so I, if you're coming in to see uh, me or my colleague for an eyelid evaluation, typically there's no cosmetic charge unless you're coming in for a, a pure cosmetic evaluation, such as um, like eyelid bags or mid-face descent or, or wrinkles. Um, if you're coming for, you know, sagging eyelids or averted eyelids in the setting of, you know, sleep apnea or, or, or aging, natural aging causes eyelids to, to sag, that definitely does not uh, get uh, charged a cosmetic consult. So I would say often, most likely than not, there's no cosmetic fee. Um, and then is there, oh, so yes. So are there any effective treatments? So, I mean, this is a huge area of interest and in study in the neuroophthalmic field. Um, people have looked at things such as bromonidine, steroids, various uh, uh, immune modulatory um, molecules, and we really haven't found anything that's really been effective. Um, there was the quark study, there's been several studies, and we just haven't found anything that we can, uh, we're even actively enrolling in at this moment. 
Um, and then does diabetes cause? So yeah, so anything that affects your vessels um, can increase your risk. So I have patients who get diagnosed with NAION and they have undiagnosed they have either undiagnosed or poorly controlled diabetes. Um, and so it's really important to work with your primary care doctor to optimize that. Um, vitamins and certain foods. So um, there's very few indications, uh, you know, macular degeneration, thyroid eye disease, a few others for specific vitamins have really helped or been shown to help in the literature. I would say in general, you know, eat well, don't smoke, uh, a lot of fish and vegetables. Um, and, you know, it sounds crazy, but individuals who meditate, who, who exercise and really have that balance, uh, really have uh, better outcomes in some of uh, in most of these diseases. If anyone is one is taking amiodarone, um, it might also depend on why you're taking amiodarone. Um, there's actually a, few, a couple other things that can happen in the eye as a result. So it may not be a bad idea, um, but I, I, don't, I, I don't know the official recommendations, so I don't wanna misspeak, um, but I, I think it's probably within the context of your diagnosis and your other uh, medical um, problems that you may have. Um, but in terms of NAION and amiodarone, it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's such a great medication one is not going to tell a cardiologist don't prescribe it because of this risk. Um, are you familiar with bone marrow stem cell treatment? Can that person, I think I know what you're, uh, are you alluding to the, the work being done abroad or domestically? Because I actually have a very strong opinion on this. <laughs> domestically. Yeah, so I, I do not support this in any way right now. I think, um, first of all, if anyone is asking for your money to take care of your eyes um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that you functionally lost your vision, you really should pause. Um, the data is not at all, um, at all safe in this field. So there have been lots of uh, publications that have shown huge issues where patients have NAION or other optic neuropathies or retinal pathology, and they go to someone and they in inject stem cells. And it's been from, you know, various places in their body or other, other sources, and it is not safe. It is not sanctioned. Um, and it leads to a lot of complications. So I definitely do not recommend doing it here or abroad. And what I like to tell my patients is that there is some promising work being done in rodents and in primates. It's not safe for humans yet. And that is why you come and see us. So we can read the literature and direct you to the right place when it is safe. So please do not. And if you, I, I, it is, oh, it's a horrible thing that's being done. Um, thank you. Um, what about EPO injection? Yeah, so people have looked at EPO um, and it was very exciting, um, but did not bear out for NAION. We were hopeful, but it is not rigorous enough, the results. Dr. Ujiri Grema, that was great. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, we've had three great presentations this evening and I think um, everybody's still around. If there are any last minute questions for either Dr. Im, Dr. Lee, or Dr. Ujiri Grema, let's um, take like two or three questions, uh, one each. Is there anybody out there who has a question for either of the, any of the doctors? Maybe everybody answered all the questions so well that there are no further questions. Mm -hmm. um, if that's the case, we will thank you all for participating this evening and remind you that there is another community lecture on Tuesday, October 11th, and that's on di diabetes and eye uh, conditions. So you can find that information on our website at www.eye.uci.edu. And we're also launching our new website, which is ophthalmology.uci.edu, where you can also register for our lectures there. 
So if nobody has any further questions, I'd like to thank all three doctors for taking their time this evening. And we hope you all enjoyed it and learned something tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.